This is my Bible. I believe it's infallible, incorruptible word of the living God. I believe I am whom he says I am. And I can do what he says I can do. I open up my heart this day to receive from God's holy word. And I declare that it will profit and prosper in my life. Faith comes and increases in me as a result of God's holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, while we're still standing, let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to read verse 24 together. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. When you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not there yet, say wait for me. Hallelujah. Please don't be in Exodus and be pretending like you're in Matthew. We'll wait for you. And if anybody's trying to look for Matthew, just look for First Kings, Second Kings, and Matthew is the next one. Why are you laughing? If somebody's here for the very first time, I can get them with that one. <laughs> We're like, where did the pastor say that Matthew is? I'm in 2 Kings, I can't find it. Matthew's in the New Testament, I was just joking. All right, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. We're going to read together just that one verse. Three, two, one, go. No one can serve two masters, for either he would hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus is teaching his disciples a powerful lesson about mastery, service. And he says, whatever you do not master has the potential to master you. Whatever you do not master, has the potential to master you. He said the key to ensuring that you will serve God as your master is to make sure that mammon is not your master. When I read that same verse to you in the Amplified Version of the Bible, it says, no one serves two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon in the Amplified is money, possessions, fame, status, whatever is valued more than the Lord. But for a moment, I just want to just focus on money. Just money. In other words... I can ask that question, how do you then ensure that you don't serve money? That money does not become your master. How do you ensure that you are serving God while money serves you and money serves your God? Today I want to start a new series of teachings that I've titled Mastering Money. And this series is aimed at helping the child of God to understand money, how it works, how it comes and goes and grows. Ladies and gentlemen, the last 12 months has taught us the plan of the enemy concerning the wealth of this world. And if you look at the level of wickedness that men will go through for money today, then the children of God must have some understanding of this thing because we need it for the work of our Heavenly Father in these last days. I'm going to start this series of teachings this morning by talking to you first about myths concerning money. Somebody say myths concerning money. Now that's M-Y-T-H-S. I know sometimes my pronunciation is so heavily it may sound like I'm talking about cow meat. <laughs> Meats concerning money. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this time. Lord, I ask in the brevity of time that I have for the grace to be able to deliver this message. Anoint me to deliver this message well, Lord, and anoint your sons and daughters that are listening to hear, understand, comprehend, receive, believe that we may all profit and prosper as a result of your word today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You may be seated. I want to start this morning by sharing with you a quick story that I heard many years ago from 
a man that had been a mentor in my life. This is a man who is a devout Christian but comes from the business world. At this time, this man by the name Bob Harrison, we, we call him for short Dr. Increase because he's full of so much wisdom about how to make money, how to manage money, and how to multiply money. So they call him Dr. Increase. It was a time in his life when he owned a Chrysler dealership in the state of California in the United States of America. And he was experiencing a season of prosperity at his dealership. God was bringing customers, things was happening. And one particular day, there was just all kinds of customers buying all kinds of cars at his forecourt. And at the time, he noticed some of his employees were not there. So he called, you know, thought to himself, where are these guys? Where are these guys? And finds about four of them in a room praying. They were Christians that worked for him. What are you guys doing here praying when the customers are on the forecourt? Come on, guys, get out there. Customers need help. Later on, he was inquisitive to pull one of them to say, by the way, what were you guys praying about? Initially, there was a hesitation to tell him what they were praying about. But finally, one said, you know, we've been making such bumper sales of cars lately. We got really concerned that all of this money coming in may change your heart. We know you're a man that loves God, but we just feel like there's a possibility that you may begin to drift away from God. Every time Bob Harrison tells this story, the next statement he says, and those ex-employees of mine, meaning he let them go. Ladies and gentlemen, you'd wonder in your heart, why was there such a controversy in the heart of these Christians about prosperity? And then it makes me want to ask additional questions like, does God really care about your finances? Does God care whether his children are broke or whether they have enough? Then we have to look at questions like, so why are many Christians broke? Why are many Christians not prosperous today? Let's assume that, okay, God cares about our financial well-being. Let me ask you a question just with a show of hands. Who would like to be wealthy here? Who would like to be prosperous? You would like to be prosperous. Okay, just like I suspected. Some hands up, some hesitation. That word prosperity in the Webster's Dictionary is defined as the condition of being successful or thriving, especially economic well-being. To prosper, the word prosper in the Hebrew, the word salak, is to advance, to progress, to succeed and be profitable. Somebody say advance, progress, succeed, and be profitable. So how many people hesitated when I said prosperity a little while ago? I'll tell you the reason why. It's because of a theory that has been called the theory of cognitive dissonance. The theory, the theory of Cognitive dissonance is one that you may have believed something for quite a while that is not true. And sometimes when something true is presented to you, there is a hesitation at best. And at worst, there is a resistance to it. If there are certain things that you have believed about money, for example, anyone who thinks having money could have devastating effect in my life. If somebody prayed for you and said, Father, may, you, may this person be wealthy and rich, you may not even say amen to it because of cognitive dissonance. If I had said, would you like to advance, make progress, succeed and be profitable, every hand would have gone up. Some hands did not go up because I used the word prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, they've done a fantastic job through media, mainstream social media for a very long time to get the mindset of Christians to become warped concerning even what God promises for his children. In certain circles, it's almost like a curse word, like a bad thing to say. How can you be a Christian and talk about prosperity? Ladies and gentlemen, if you say you want to progress, advance, succeed, and be profitable, then you're also saying, I want to be prosperous. Today, I want to talk to you 
about seven different myths concerning money. Now, I know there are loads and loads and loads. These seven are just the ones that the Lord put on my heart. And I want you to write them down because as you listen, please be honest enough that you will take notice of the one that applies to your life. Number one, money is the root of evil. Anybody ever heard that before? Be honest. Show of hands. Money is the root of evil. Put your hands down. How many people believe money is the root of evil? Let's put our hands up again. Okay, a few hands has gone up. It's not true. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 10. Turn to it very quickly. This is the popular scripture that many would quote. And when they quote this, they then say, can you see money is the root of all evil? But in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10, what the Bible says is that for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Money is not evil, it's the love. The inordinate love lost affection for money. That God says is wrong. If you notice the verses before verse 10, you would see what Paul was discussing before he came to this statement. In verse 6, he said, Now godliness, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with this we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drawn men in destruction and perdition. Then he said, for the love of money is the root of all evil. A very common thing that many believe, including Christians, it's not true. Money is neither good nor bad. Money only takes up the personality of the one that has it. Or should I say, money only amplifies your true personality. Number two. Number two, another very good statement. I want you to just tell me if you think this is right or wrong. Money changes a person's character negatively. Anybody agree with me? Very quickly. All right, you don't want to put your hand up anymore. You think, oh, pastor's just, you know, tricking us now. Many people in our world believe that money changes a person's character negatively. It's not true. Turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 13. Let me show you something very quickly about a man that many of us know of in the Bible. The great man by the name Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, the Bible introduces us to Abraham and by Genesis chapter 13 starts to tell us some things about his life. In the second verse of Genesis chapter 13, the Bible said, Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. In other words, don't get confused. God inspires Moses while he's writing that. Let me tell you the kind of wealth he had. He had livestock, he had gold, and he had silver. As a matter of fact, you get to the sixth verse and the Bible talked about an issue that had come up with Abraham and his nephew Lot. It said, now the land was not able to support them, that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe the land these guys were on was not like one acre or two acre. If you don't believe me, Abraham himself alone had more than 150 servants in his household. So the Bible talks about Abraham having this level of incredible real estate, incredible wealth. And then you turn to James chapter 2 verse 23 and you see in Abraham's resume how God sees him. James chapter 2 verse 23. You can write it down if you can't open to it very quickly. The Bible says, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. So ladies and gentlemen, you can have that much wealth and still be a friend of God. 
Abraham grew in wealth and it, it never changed his character. He never became a negative person before God. As a matter of fact, another character by the name of David, many of us know him as King David. The Bible refers to him as a man after God's own heart. If you go and study the offering that David personally gave for the building of God's temple. If you see the amount of shekels, the weight of gold, the weight of silver, and all that David in today's money runs into billions. So you can say David must have been a multi-billionaire. And yet, the Bible said he was a man after God's own heart. So money does not change your character negatively. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll be wondering why is Pastor Daniel talking about this? And because in the next three weeks, I'm going to be speaking specifically about making money from biblical truths. Managing money and multiplying money. I'll tell you in a little while, but one of the reasons why Christians are struggling is because we don't know these things. And there's a lot of wicked people out there. Very wicked. I've seen so much wickedness in the last 10 months. People destroying other people's businesses. Monopolies crushing their competitors. Because of who is going to control the wealth when the dust settles. Have you noticed how much con, conning and, and you know, fraud stars? Have you seen the increase of it? They're conning people left, right and center. People are ruthless right now for money. So God's children cannot afford to be ignorant. Number three, money is not that important to life. Anybody ever heard anyone say that money is not that important? Money, please don't make money a big deal. A wealthy man never said it. It was a poor person that said it. And the poor person only said it because they have not tasted what difference money can make. The wisest man of his time, the man that God said, I will make you wiser than any other human being on the face of the earth. The writer of the book of Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 19, if you can turn to it very quickly, please do. If not, you can just write it down. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 19. I want you to see what this wise man Solomon said about money. Verse 19. A feast is for laughter and wine makes merry. But money answers everything. Some of you have a very, very serious face on you now. Come on, just smile a little bit. It's all part of the cognitive dissonance. Satan has done such a number on us. As soon as the preacher mentions the word money, people padlock their wallet. No, God wants you to know about this. Jesus taught his disciples so many ways, so many lessons. As a matter of fact, somebody did a research once and said Jesus actually talked about increased provision seed more than any other subject. You think God does not know what's important to you. Christians act like money is not that important. And you give the best hours of your week, the best days of your life. It's hard to serve God. You cannot commit to anything in the church. You cannot commit to any project. Work, 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 work. And then we tell ourselves money is not important. Who is lying to who? We might as well just find out how to make it with minimal effort. So we can give our lives to serve God. Hmm. It's good to serve God. I enjoy serving him. I said something to you a little while ago about what God did in my life and what my minimum earning power has been since 1999. I forgot to mention something, except when I'm pastoring on pastor's salary. It's only when I'm taking a pastor's salary and I stop consulting that I have to settle for a quarter of what I can make by myself. And yet you have people say, oh, all those people behind the pulpit, they just want money. You're so mistaken. If money was the motivation of many people behind the pulpit, they would be nowhere near the pulpit. If money was what they were looking for. Trust me. Trust me. If money was what they're looking for, they'd be nowhere near. People you say, oh, all those tele-evangelists, they make so much money. I was on television on Fox TV from 2006 in my city. 
After a year and a half, nobody had ever given a dime. I cried out to God on the 1st of January 2008. I said, God, I'm not doing this anymore. We're owing Fox money. We can't pay our bills. I have full-time staff making 22 episodes of a show every month because I was on television right after Ken Copeland five days a week. I said, God, I can't do this anymore. We're racking up debt. And God sent a pastor from Miami to call me out of the blue and to say, God just said to tell you that the TV station is his, not yours, and you can't stop it. I felt like saying, it's good for you to say that. And then he finished his statement by saying, by the way, God just told me to send you some money. By the time you get back to Oregon, I was in Florida on that day. He said, by the time you get back to Oregon, there should be an envelope waiting for you. When I got back to Oregon, it was not just an envelope, but for the first time, somebody in the city also and help started to come until I got to the stage where I said the church does not need to put a dime in the TV ministry anymore I began to raise partners myself TV ministry became under Daniel Machula Ministries. I had some partners that one partner would give me more than two thousand dollars a month said I believe in what God is having you preach clean Berkey just one person he would say here Every month, I promise. The first time he took me out to lunch, he gave me $25,000 and he said, this is just status. He said, God told me to make sure that what he has given you to preach goes far. We're still talking about whether money is important. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 15. Please write it down very quickly. Proverbs 10 15 says money is a defense. <laughs> that's, my, that's my summary of that verse. In Exodus chapter 2 verses 20 to 22, God was speaking to Moses and talking about the plan of delivering his children, the Hebrews, from Egypt. Then you wonder, why did God also have to add that, by the way, Moses, not only am I going to deliver you guys, but when you guys come out of Egypt, you're not coming out empty. And then God said, you know something, I'm going to give you favor. You're going to ask from the Egyptians articles of gold and silver and purple and stuff. And you're going to plunder them. In other words, God is saying, you see, all that money they cheated you off. All the years they kept you and your father and your grandfather are slaves. You're wiping them out when I bring you out. Why is it important to God to do that? Because he knew one day he was going to say to them in the wilderness, build me a tabernacle. And God ain't cheap. Go read it. Even when God chooses wood, he chooses the best wood. Make sure it's acacia wood. Then God will say, then overlay it with gold. Somebody said, some of these ladies are just too materialistic. They let, just tell them, I'm just like my heavenly father. God just loves gold so much. Have you seen Solomon's temple? God says, this one gold. Make that one gold. Even all the utensils, gold, gold, gold. That's God. Don't let anybody. Ladies, if you like your blings, and anybody picks on you, just tell them, I'm just like my heavenly father. I like it just the way he likes. God made the garden of Eden. And as soon as he made Eve, the Bible said he also made a river that had good gold. So that when Eve says, honey, I need some blings. <laughs> there was no stores at that time. So Adam knows where to go get the bling. <laughs> See the ladies, they just lit up. All of a sudden, all the ladies in the room just lit up. In Luke chapter 5, the Bible tells us of the incident just before Jesus called his disciples into ministry. And I can deduce from that incident where they had not caught anything and they were broke. And he helped them to experience miracle provision. Peter and all the guys would have said, just take all of this, go to my wife, just tell my wife, man, it's raining. <laughs> it's raining cash right now. And then Jesus said, okay, now that you guys know about supernatural provision, now follow me. Let's go into ministry. Isn't it shocking that the first time Jesus is going to send disciples out for ministry, he says, don't take money with you. Don't take your wallet. Don't take any bread. Don't take nothing. I'm sure the guys will be scratching their head like, what's he trying to do to us? Make us suffer. What he was saying is, I've taught you guys a lot about supernatural provision. Go. And go experience the supernatural provision of God. And when they came back, Jesus asked them, lack ye anything? They said, no, we didn't. That's why I say to people, when people talk about ministry, please always pray. Before you get behind a pulpit, pray, God, let this work in my life. So that as a minister, when you share something, it's not like you're just boasting. It's not like you're just trying to attract attention to yourself. But you want to encourage the people God has called you to serve, to believe that God is faithful. 
God, don't let me preach that you give oil of joy for mourning. Don't let me preach that you take up spirit of heaviness and then I'm the pastor that is talking about depression all the time. One day I found a pastor who was telling the congregation, you know, I'm always suffering from depression. I'm thinking, I put one feet in front of the other. I'm getting out of that place. Because guess what? If I'm going through some major emotional stuff, you can't help me. You can't give me what you don't have. I don't get impressed with spiritual gymnastics. A lot of people do a lot of spiritual gymnastics. No, I want to see what's working in your life. If it's not working for you, don't tell me about it. It must work. If you're depressed and sad every day. No, I don't want you as my pastor. I can go choose another one. I need the one who is happy. Check out the church. Sit down in the pew. Does the pastor look happy? Okay, maybe I can get some happiness in here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some people say, oh, just keep the pastors nice and broke so they can stay humble. I don't want a broke pastor. I'm telling you, I don't. I don't know about you, but I don't. Because when I'm struggling, I need somebody who can help me. I need somebody who can share some testimonies that will lift up my spirit. Let's take this thing further. Another statement is some people are destined to be poor. Oh my God, is that the time? Somebody who is really anointed here needs to stop the clock for the next 15 minutes. I need somebody really anointed like Joshua. Just stop the time for the next 15 minutes. Just say, God, give Pastor Daniel 15 minutes extra. Anybody ever heard that before? Some people are destined to be poor. It's not true. Can you imagine God bringing babies into the world and tell the angels, stamp that one rich, stamp that one average, stamp that one poor? No way. God will be guilty of being a bad God. What criteria will he use to decide who is going to be poor in their lives? Now, I understand sometimes the circumstances of life where we're born, the family we're born into, the parents that we're born into, and even sometimes even the location, the region, the culture around the people can become a challenge. Because remember, you can only go as far as you're thinking. If you're surrounded with people who tell you all the time, no, we don't do that, you know, in this family we're poor, you know, we don't have those kind of things. They kill the dreams in a little child from a young age. Child wants to take a big apple. They tell the child, no, 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 you can't have a big apple. You have to take that small one. They just tell the child and, and condition the mind of the person that they never believe God for much. But even in those cases, you still hear stories of how God brings out his children out of abject poverty. In the first service, I shared a little story about my lineage. My father came from such a poor family. They didn't even know they were poor. <laughs> <laughs> probably the whole neighborhood was similar my grandfather was so poor that even though my father was very smart when he finished primary school he couldn't go to secondary school now ladies and gentlemen understand we're not talking about buying paying for school fees private school fees to go to school at the time just meant the parent needed to be able to afford the shirt the trouser the slippers for the kid and some notebooks and my father said, his dad called him and said, I'm sorry, I can't do this for you and your brother at the same time. They were from a Muslim family at the time. And he said, you know, you just go and go to the Quran school and send his brother to go get the education. But he was so determined, he wanted to make something of his life. He began to beg his friends when they come back from school, show me your math book. What did you learn today? Show me. How did the teachers show you? He never stepped into secondary school but ended up doing GCSE one year that he did so well he got a scholarship from the Queen of England and that's how he left Nigeria to come to England to study this was the kid whose parents were so poor I also forgot to tell you actually very interesting he was the first to become a Christian in his family so even when things are rough God can still pull you out I know about the crab ideology you know what crabs do you don't have to worry about them when you put them in the bucket. They'll pull each other back. That's why sometimes when God wants to set you free, he will pull you away from family. He will pull you away from some of the people who want to pull you down. He will pull you out of that place so he can do something with your life. I dare to say to somebody this morning that poverty many times is a choice. The main causes of poverty is ignorance, laziness, and rebellion. Those three things. In Proverbs chapter 11, verses 24 to 25. 
Solomon helps us to understand that the ignorance of the principles of generosity is the reason why people are poor. He said, for he that gathereth and withholds more than his meat tends to poverty. But he that scatters, the generous one, tends to plenty. In the world, it's the reverse. In the world, if you want to have, you grab everything you can, you, you sit on the can, and you stay as stingy as ever. But in the kingdom of God, God says if you want to increase, you become the generous one. I never understood that principle for a long time until I realized that God is always looking for distribution centers. He's looking for his children. Can I trust you if I change your paycheck from 2,000 a month to 4,000 a month? If I tell you, put another child on scholarship, will you do it? If I tell you to start direct debit for about four or five kids whose parents may need a little bit of help, will you do it? That is the basis of which God increases his children. So ignorance many times affects us. Proverbs 24, 33 to 34. The Bible also talks about the person. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folded of arms, and your poverty will crop up. Crawl up. Someone said, oh, I can't go to work because there's a lion in the street. Solomon said, don't worry, there's poverty for you. I hate to admit this, but I've met a few lazy Christians. Make every excuse in the world not to go solve problems for other people. I'm doing this, I'm working on this, but none of it is really generating money. Please, we've got to repent and change. The other thing you talked about was rebellion. Every time you study the children of Israel, every time Israel experiences drought, crop failure, it's always after they've rebelled against God. As a matter of fact, at the time, I studied it so much that I concluded that one of the first things that God does to get your attention when you're rebelling is he takes away prosperity and provision. Ask many people who have gone riotous, the prodigal son scenario. You will spend it all, you would lose it all, and it will get your attention. You will find yourself in the place where you're begging for little and start thinking, but wait a minute, how did I get to this place? That's how God will always get the attention of children of Israel. And if he doesn't get the attention, then they go through things like pestilence, sickness. And then at the very worst, they get enemy invasion and they're taken away as slaves. When their heart is so hard in rebellion. That's what always happens to Israel. Then some country will be empowered by God. They would come, they would take them away as slaves. But rebellion against God is dangerous if you want to prosper. Number five. Heard this one before, rich people are lucky. I've heard that. Rich people are just lucky. Anybody heard that before? Let me tell you the truth. Legitimately rich people got wealthy through intelligence, hard work, and cooperation with the laws of money. I'm in another season now of re-educating myself. Yes, I read my Bible. Yes, I do what, I'm necess what is necessary for me to serve the people of God. But my wife and I are at an age where I need to be smart. The other day I was just watching a YouTube video and some guy who's 37 years old was talking about how he paid off his mortgage in seven years. And I kind of shook my head. I thought, what? 37? And the guy's talking about, oh, so I did this. Let me tell you the 10 principles of how I'm totally debt free now, including my house. This guy's here in London. Young man, African heritage. Talking about how we pay. I'm thinking to myself, 37. Ooh. I don't know about you, but he only knew something. He learned something that others have not learned. When you get to a certain age, you can't be getting 22-year mortgage anymore. Mm -mm. It's too late. Mm -mm. They'll count the age and they say, mm, you can't be paying us at 75. <laughs> so we have to increase in wisdom. Rich people are not just lucky. Trust me, if you watch enough YouTube videos, you'll find out why people stay poor, why people struggle, and why the rich seem to always get richer. Have you noticed how some of them would say their business failed, they went bankrupt? Give them two years, they're back up again because of what they know. It's not about working hard, it's about working smart. Don't kill yourself working two, three jobs. Don't kill yourself working two, three jobs. Just figure out. Next week, I'm going to talk to you about making money. Please listen to me. Making money 
one week. The following week, managing money. The following week, multiplying money. You have to acquire wisdom. For the very rich, money is just like a game. It's a game that they have mastered. And they know how to make it. Praise the name of the Lord. Number six. Money will bring me all the happiness and joy that I want. Now, this is another interesting one. The same Solomon. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 4 to 11. Someone say money will buy all happiness. Remember when we read earlier on from Ecclesiastes when he said um, money answers all things? Some of us Christians have kind of modified that a little bit when we say money answers most things. <laughs> you know why? For example, money can't buy love. Guy thinks, hey, I'm, I'm loaded. I can get any girl I want to love you. Mm, she'll marry you. She'll take your money. But she'll have a boyfriend on the side. The one she really loves. And if she's in America, she will wait for a little while. And then she'll get half. And when she gets half, then she goes to be the one with the one that she really loves. Money can't buy love. You know, I'm just going to flash my car and that girl is going to want me. Come on, grow up. Money can't buy love. And the girl that you win with your car. That is just a girl, not a wife. Mm -hmm. He'll find a wife, finds a good thing. Because when you find a wife, you find the one that says, okay, can you really afford to have that car? Mm -hmm. money will bring me all the joy and happiness it's a myth Hollywood is full of very rich and miserable people see God has not created any material thing that can fully satisfy or fulfill man there's one thing I thank God for today as someone who is called to ministries God thank you for the spirit of contentment I don't say to boast but I know he has given me that grace I don't need to have an expensive wristwatch. 80% of anything I have was a gift. I've never bought an expensive wristwatch. Not once. I don't need to have a fancy car. I don't need to ever drive a Ferrari. Notice I said I don't need. I'm not saying if somebody gives it to me, I won't drive. <laughs> but I don't need it. I don't need it to be fulfilled. I don't need a jet to be fulfilled. I know about how that spirit of greed creeps on people. And draws them away from God. But one thing I've also noticed is that those people have always had that in them. It just didn't show when they didn't have much. But it was always there. Godly contentment. Great gain. Sometimes my wife has a go at me. I can go into a shop. Number one, I don't even go into a shop unless I need something. And when I need something, sometimes I'm contemplating, contemplating, and I finally pick the thing up. And I might even go home and say, I actually don't need it, and just take it back and drop it off. The way God blesses me now, he just does it supernaturally. He puts it on the heart of people, and he just bless me. And sometimes I just look and I say, gosh, how come I have all of these things? Half of it I didn't buy. If I open my drawer, the number of perfumes that I did, I didn't buy. Maybe 10% of it I didn't buy. You've got to work on that awareness that money is not going to bring you all the happiness. So don't kill yourself, Gavin. Remember what Timothy said? He said, those who lost after money end up gathering what? Pain. Last one. You cannot have lots of money and still be righteous. You cannot have lots of money and still be righteous. Let me read to you very quickly in Psalm 112, the words of David, Psalm 112. Remember what I shared with you about the story of Bob Harrison and how the employees were praying. You know what I mean by being righteous? Right standing with God, living a right lifestyle. Being righteous is doing the right thing even when nobody's watching. Mm -hmm. Right standing with God. The Bible says in Psalm 112 verse 1, blessed is the man. Who fears the Lord? Who delights greatly in his commandments? His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house. And his righteousness endures 
for a while. What does it say? Righteousness. And so a man can be righteous forever even though he has wealth and riches. Righteousness is about loving God more than lost him for anything in this world. I've discovered something. When you get to the place where you're not lost in for stuff, God will give it to you. Because he knows it's not going to affect you. You know another prayer I pray? Father, please don't let me own anything that if you ask me to give it away, I can't give it. It's a big one. And it taught me for many years. One of the areas it taught me was things like watches. He will set me up, particularly when I was in America. There's a particular millionaire Christian man, uh, Mike Rovner from California that became a friend of mine twice. He took off an expensive wristwatch. Once we were in Hawaii at the conference, he just walked up to me, took off his watch, said, Daniel, I bought this watch 40 days ago. I've been wearing it for 40 straight days. And the Lord just told me to take it off and give it to you. I didn't know the value of the watch until until I was at church one day. And one of the ladies at church who is married to a very wealthy family, Tamara Pretrojetti, looked at me and said, man, pastor, where'd you get that watch? I had no clue. From that day, I kept the watch at home. From that day, I decided this one is for visiting the queen and the kings. And one day we had a conference and we had a guest minister. And I heard the Lord say, today you're going to sow a sacrifice. You said, go back home in the break session and go bring that watch and give it to this minister. Ah. (laughs) What I was keeping at home. I picked it up. The Lord reminded me to take the case. And the warranty that Mike had posted to me to say it had a lifetime warranty. He said, add the warranty too. Now, what, and what really affected me was the person God told me to give it to already had a Rolex. I'm like, God, this, 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 anybody been there before? Like, this is not even fair. <laughs> I bought one, the, probably the most expensive one I ever bought for myself. On my way from Los Angeles to Nigeria. And I was going to preach in Nigeria. And the Sunday when I was going to preach. I got on the platform. To, just before going on the platform. I just heard. Take off your watch and give it to the pastor. I just said. Ah, this devil is playing tricks with my mind. <laughs> because, because I've done it once. You want to do it again. So I ignored it. Then it came back to me. Again. I said okay God if it's really you. You would have to really bother me with this. I go up. Up the stairs to the platform where I'm going to preach. He had introduced me. The church had stood up. They sat down. I opened my Bible to preach and I heard again. Didn't I tell you to give him that watch? And I just climbed down very gently and took off the watch and gave it to the pastor. And of course, the pastor was filled with joy. Ah, really? But I wasn't filled with joy. <laughs> I know when people say, oh, I'm a joyful giver. You haven't given. If you said, I was dancing when I gave it, let me tell you something. That wasn't a sacrifice. There is a place that you give. Now, I know some of you heard the story of how the debt-free property came. What I did not tell you was that same month on the 5th of January, I was at a conference in Florida. And the Lord said, give one time offering that is equivalent to the mortgage of the church, to the monthly mortgage of the church. Trust me, it wasn't hundreds. It was a man called Mike Murdoch that a lot of people call thieves today. They say, oh, he's a thief, he's a thief. He said, God just told me there's somebody here. If you would hear the voice of God and give the equivalence of one month's mortgage, God said within 90 days he was going to give you a debt-free property. I did it on the 5th of January. On the 25th of January, I was given a debt. That's why I always warn people. When you hear them saying all these things they say on the internet, false prophet, be careful. The Bible said, believe his prophet and you will prosper. Be careful. Careful, discern with God yourself. All right, I've got to really end this. Let's, let's stand up together. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 to 19. The reason why I said stand up is because if you don't, I'm going to keep going. First Timothy chapter 6. See, people say they hate their job. I don't know what they're talking about. I love mine. I love mine. I'll keep you here all day long. We'll go from verse to verse, scripture to scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 to 19. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty or to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives rightly all things to enjoy. Let them do good that they may be rich in good works. Somebody say rich in good works. Say ready to give 
willing to share. And finally, in verse 19, he said, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. My brothers and sisters, God did, does not have a problem with you becoming wealthy. He's only concerned with the motives of your heart. Those who are scared of wealth are people who really do not trust themselves and their motives concerning money. Righteous children of God have preordained visions and dreams that they must accomplish. Hence, when you keep believing myths that hinder you from prospering, you may be putting the fulfillment of those visions and dreams at risk. Let's bow our heads for prayer. As I prayed this morning, the Lord said, the first thing you're going to ask my children to do is to repent for negative words you have spoken about financial well-being. I literally felt like the Lord said, some of my children have used their mouth to declare the limitations of their financial life. Some others have cursed themselves with their mouth. And I just want you to just take a moment, even if you can't remember what you said, just say, Father, if there's anything that I've said out of my mouth that has created a limit to what you can do in my life, please forgive me. Just a very simple prayer, but sincere. Maybe you walk past a nice car and you said, I can never see myself driving a car like that. And every demon in the area said, Amen. You created a limitation. Or you saw a nice house. I can never see myself living in a house like that. And every demon said, Amen. God said, Today, repent and ask him to forgive you for any bad words you have spoken over your life. And then secondly, he said, also pray and repent for ignorance. If you're that Christian that cannot boast of at least five books about making, managing, or multiplying money on your bookshelf, you need to ask God to forgive you. It means you've not made any effort to learn. Lord, forgive me. Lord, I pray personally for forgiveness. Some of those years when I said I was pastoring and I said, I don't care, I don't care about anything and I wasted everything that you had kept for me and I committed intellectual suicide until you began to teach me again why are you losing the properties I gave you you're being dumb this is not what pastoring is all about please repent if you have been lazy you know it yourself nobody needs to tell you if you have been making excuses not to work over the years ask God to forgive you money comes when we solve problems for people it's called work finally ask the Lord to forgive you if you've been rebellious if in any way shape or form you know you opened up your life to sin some people change their financial destiny because of five minutes of fornication they conjugated spiritually in the soul and physically with another person that had a curse of poverty and their financial story changed because many people don't know that it's not a physical act, it's a spiritual act. Before you go in, make sure that you are willing to take anything that person is carrying in their lives. Ask the Lord to forgive you. I'm not afraid to say this, you're watching from home or you're in the building. You've been stealing from God. You've listened to the naysayers that say you don't need to have any covenant of tithing with God. You don't need to give God anything. The last time I checked, the people who advocate that, they don't experience the miracles of God. Maybe the Lord is convicting you that you've not been faithful to Him. Between you and God, it has nothing to do with the preacher. Just repent and tell Him, God, forgive me. Then begin to pray, Father, whatever area of the seven myths that I told you about that affected your life, anything that kind of was close to home, anyone that when you heard it, it felt like an ouch, just ask the Lord, Lord, it's time for a turnaround. Renew my mind, Lord. Renew my mind. Change my heart. Teach me your word. Teach me your way. Help me, Lord. In my lifetime, I want to do good things for you. I want to touch lives for you. I want to bless many people. I want to pay other people's mortgages. I want to bless other people. Send other people's children to get a good education. Lord, I would love to buy a car for somebody in my lifetime. I would love to help somebody who is stuck in my lifetime. Father, renew my mind. Take away every form of selfishness that I've had. Bless me, Lord. Give me faith to believe you as the provider. 
in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Thank you, Father. Very quickly, I've got to do this before we round up our service. I'm so sorry, time is so fast spent. But if there's anybody here who you really, as of right now, does not believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of your life, you're not confident that you have a right relationship with your Heavenly Father. You're not confident that if something was to happen to you today and you close your eyes, you're going to end up being with Him. Or you're watching online. You've heard all of these things that I have to share, but please understand all these promises are for children of God. It's not for people outside of the family. Very simple prayer. Would you repeat after me? Just say, Heavenly Father, please forgive me. I choose to believe that you gave yourself son Jesus to die on the cross for me. I confess every sin. Forgive me, Lord. I give my life to you. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come be the Lord of my life. Holy Spirit of God, come and fill me and lead me and guide me. Amen. Amen. And for those who prayed that prayer for the very first time, I just ask that you please find a Bible-believing church that you can go to and begin to learn. If you're anywhere within travel distance of Milton Keynes, you're welcome to come join us here. We have some good discipleship programs that would help you grow in your walk with the Lord. Father, I thank you for what you are doing with us at the Kingdom Faith Church. Thank you for this season of stretching our faith and believing you, Father God, to increase. Lord, I ask, let the miracles begin today. Lord, let the miracles begin today. Lord, let the miracles begin today. For every son and daughter who has had a limitation on their financial well-being, Father, let the limits be broken off. Let the glass ceilings be broken off. Let every satanic strongholds be destroyed. Father, even if there are curses against finances, I pray, Lord, by the blood of Jesus, let those curses be broken. Let every son and daughter be set free to prosper in you and fulfill your plan and your purpose for their lives. In Jesus' mighty name.